Thanks. So yeah, as, as Howard mentioned today, I will talk about, um, not about worms, but I will talk about um, fish and uh, a lipidomic study that we just recently published. And um, where we found that sphingolipids control oriented cell division. Um, so sort of the, the, the classical image of um, metabolism looks a little bit like this, that um, it sort of metabolism provides the body with energy and building blocks uh, so that it can run normally and everything has to be well balanced um, not to get sick. And of course, there, there's good evidence supporting this kind of image. I mean, you have all the inherited metabolic disorders um, like lipid storage diseases, Tysacs, uh, familial cholesterol emia, or other metabolic um, diseases like maple, the, the famous maple syrup urine disease or the, the facets of, of mitochondrial diseases. And indeed, in these cases, uh, something breaks and then metabolism doesn't work like it should anymore. And also, I mean, we have all the acquired metabolic disorders, atherosclerosis or, or obesity-induced type 2 diabetic metabolic syndrome, where, where the diet plays a big role, vitamin deficiencies and toxin-induced neuropathies. But um, indeed, over the last decade or so, it becomes more and more obvious that metabolism is not just providing energy and, and building blocks to the body, but it actually can control cellular functions. And um, the field where this is already well established and, and, and uh, more understood is in immunity. So um, for example, in T-cell, um, uh, metabolism and T cell development and T cell functions, people have found many metabolites that control cellular function. So, for example, glucose uptake, glycolysis, lactate production um, controls um, the, 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 the function of effector T cells. Um, fatty acid uptake and fatty acid metabolism is, is very important in, in regulating regulatory. T cell development. And uh, so many individual and specific metabolic pathways have been identified that really control specific functions in, um, in immune cells. And these pathways and metabolites have become drug targets already. And, and people are manipulating um, immune responses by targeting metabolism directly. And um, I'm interested in kind of similar roles of metabolism in development. And for the moment, the, the picture of or, or developmental uh, biology is still heavily dominated by the, the, the central dogma of molecular biology, so that you have this information flow from DNA to RNA to proteins. Um, but in fact, many of these proteins are enzymes or they're receptors, so they either change uh, metabolism or they listen to metabolites. So in the end, uh, very often the, the actual state of the cell and its fate um, is determined by the metabolite, by the lipid, by the amino acid, by the carbohydrate. So we know already a lot on the DNA level. We, we, we have the genome sequence, genes annotated. We, we also know a lot about development on the RNA levels as um, we have EST libraries, we have transcriptome analysis. We are starting also to understand the, the proteome, protein complexes, interactomes. And now we are at a stage where we have the technology to also um, start studying the me metabolome. And uh, we particularly study uh, lipids, so the lipidome, and there, I mean, we can have ligands or other signals. We can have protein modifications. Uh, which are lipids, we can have membrane identity determinants or just structural elements in, in membranes. And uh, sort of the kind of questions I'm interested in uh, in development is, are there any lipids which are important for development? And I think this we, we've shown already. Um, and then, of course, we want to identify the, the lipids which are important, how they're produced, how they change during development and how their synthesis is regulated. And often the hardest question is, 
how do they function mechanistically in development? Um, but you can get at this because you can manipulate the system at all these levels also. So you can use mutations or transgenes on the DNA level. You can use uh, knockdowns or I'm going to show Morpholino. Uh, so either by RNAi and today I'm going to show Morpholino knockdowns in the, in the zebrafish. You can use inhibitors for the proteins or you can manipulate the system directly on the level of the metabolites by feeding metabolites or other chemicals or what we're using in the in the lab um, are caged metabolites so that you can control uh, spatial temporally when a specific uh, metabolite is in action. So um, the story I want to talk about today um, it's about sphingolipids controlling oriented cell divisions in early vertebrate uh, development. And there we're looking at um, a zebrafish embryo, get the laser pointer, um, an early zebrafish embryo. And here you can see the, the yolk cell and on top the early um, embryo is just more or less a clump of cells. But then uh, with onset of gastrulations, you, there's something that uh, that forms that then starts looking like like an animal and uh, for this you have these cells so uh, you have uh, in on the outside here uh, dorsally you have these epiblast cells which start uh, moving downwards and then you have internalizing hypoblast cells um, that then move up and in the end um, you get something uh, at the end of gastrulation, something that has a head and a tail. And um, so these cells are moving, they're elongating here at this, uh, the, the lateral ones are elongating in this direction and, and uh, the dorsal cells are elongating in that direction, they're moving down. But another thing that they're doing to, to sort of uh, elongate the body axis is that all the cell divisions are stereotypic and they're aligned along the body axis, the, the embryonic axis between the animal pole and the vegetal pole. So all the cell divisions uh, of these dorsal epiblast cells are going to align like this. And um, this is regulated by the non-canonical wind signaling, uh, also called planar cell polarity pathway, PCP. And uh, there you have these non-canonical wind ligands, wind 11 and wind 5, which uh, bind to the receptor frizzle. And then intracellularly, they have um, a transcriptional, they trigger a transcriptional response. But then very importantly, also, they regulate uh, the actin cytoskeleton. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. So there you have the row A, which um, can control the actin cytoskeleton in two ways either via rho kinase uh, and, and myosin. Uh, this is more for the, for the branched actin cytoskeleton. And then here on this uh, side, uh, via the formin diaphanous, um, the rho A can regulate actin cables, so longer unbranched uh, actin polymers. And what um, our collaborator, Irinka Castagnon, showed a few years ago is that in this oriented cell division, a major player is this transmembrane protein, anthrax toxin receptor 2A. And uh, if you knock this down, then these um, oriented cell divisions that you have in the, in the dorsal epiblast cells, they become randomized. So you can quantify this uh, on this kind of um, plot here. And um, here you can see, that uh, the wild type uh, cell divisions are aligned with the AV axis, while in the anthrax receptor 2A uh, knockdown, you have randomized uh, cell divisions. And um, Irinka characterized this back in the day and um, found, described the different steps that the cells have to undergo to align uh, their cell divisions along the embryonic axis. And um, the first step is that this wind, uh, wind 5 ligand uh, causes the cells to polarize. And then uh, row A, through the action of 
glucokinase and, and myosin forms this actin cap uh, on one end of the, of the cell aligned uh, with the axis. And then this anthrax toxin receptor 2A is recruited to the actin cap via its actin uh, interaction motif. And so you have an anthrax toxin receptor cap, which co-localized with the actin cap. And then the, when, the, when the anthrax toxin receptor arrives there, it triggers a change of binding um, of, of the in interaction partner of the row A. So row A does not interact with the row kinase anymore, but then it interacts with diaphanous and activates diaphanous. Uh, this makes these actin cables, which now uh, pull in the, the mitotic spindle. And like this, uh, the mitotic spindle gets aligned with, um, with these caps. And because the, the spindle is aligned with the caps, it is aligned with the embryonic axis in this way. So um, the ligand, many of the protein factors are actually lipid modified. We have uh, transmembrane, uh, transmembrane protein, the, the, the cortical actin of course interacts with the membrane. So we have um, a lot of involvement of, of membrane in this whole process. So we were wondering if uh, membrane lipids do play a role in the, in the wind regulated uh, cell divisions. And uh, to explore this, we um, use the targeted lipidomics approach of these um, gastrulating zebrafish embryos. So we separated the, the actual embryo uh, from the yolk cell and um, we either treated the embryo with control morpholino or with uh, wind 5 b uh, no, uh, morpholino, so knocking down the, the, the signaling pathway that controls the oriented cell division. And then we, we looked at uh, the lipid profiles in the embryos and in the yolk cell. So the most striking difference that we saw in the um, uh, wind 5 b knockdown embryos uh, was a downregulation of sphingolipids. So here, this is a volcano plot. Here you see the, the fold change um, of Win5 versus control. And uh, on the y-axis, you see statistical significance with here the dotted line, a cutoff of uh, P equals 0 0.05. And uh, you can see that yeah, most sphingolipids are downregulated and you have ceramides, hexacid ceramides, and sphingomyelin, which are statistically significantly Downregulated. The phospholipids, on the other hand, um, are much more balanced, and uh, we see much less uh, significant differences here. Um, also, as a control in the yolk, uh, we don't see much uh, of a difference neither in the sphingolipids nor in the phospholipids. So, um, yes, this was interesting to see that that sphingolipids seem to be regulated, but is this? Uh, ah, yeah, sorry. Um, so the, the sphingolipids can either be uh, made by the de novo pathway or uh, by the salvage pathway from already existing uh, sphingolipids. And what we saw was that also the de novo pathway with dihydrosamides and hexosyl dihydrosamides and, and dihydrosphingomyelin um, was affected and, and these uh, de novo synthesized. Uh, sphingolipids were downregulated. Also, we measured sphinganine and sphingosine, which were downregulated. And uh, we also tested SPT activity with a heavy serine tracer experiment. And um, we concluded from all of this that actually um, wind signaling controls the SPT activity um, in the embryo. Now, are sphingolipids important for oriented cell division? And um, to test this, we generated uh, CRISPR mutants and um, did SPTLC1 CRISPR and, and morpholinos. And here are the results for the, for the CRISPR mutant. So just to remind you here, um, this is the way we quantify the, if, if the division is along the embryonic axis, we, we measure it as 90 degrees, and if it's orthogonal uh, as zero 
zero degrees. And in a wild type or in a heterozygous uh, mutant, you can see that um, the divisions are nicely aligned. In an SPTLC1 CRISPR uh, uh, homozygous mutant, we get randomized uh, divisions. We confirmed this also um, by Morpholino knockdown. So um, if you knock down the, the SPTLC1 subunit, you get randomized divisions. And if you inject sphinganine, the, the first uh, sphingoid base, which is produced in the, by the de, de novo pathway, then you can rescue this phenotype and um, divisions are aligned again in the, in the rescued uh, embryos. So indeed, the, the sphingolipids are important for oriented cell division, but uh, is this randomization just because, yeah, I mean, sphingolipids are essential, so are, are these cells just messed up? So um, as Irinka uh, characterized all these uh, steps in the process for oriented cell division, we could go step by step and check um, which step uh, is affected. And in fact, um, the actin cap uh, forms just fine. So uh, the, the activity of the row A is not uh, affected. Um, we have a cortical actin cap. The anthrax toxin receptor is normally recruited to the, to the actin cap. So the, the anthrax toxin receptor cap forms normally. Then um, the next step is that diaphanous has to be recruited and activated so that um, the spindle gets pulled in. And this step is still defective. So the, 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 the caps form, but the spindle doesn't get aligned along uh, in respect to the caps. The interesting thing is that uh, the interactions um, of anthrax toxin receptor with row A and with diaphanous are not changed. So it's just that the diaphanous doesn't get activated. And um, yeah, to, to cut the long story short, uh, what we found was that in fact, the sphingolipids they control anthrax toxin receptor palmitolation. And by this, this then affects the activation of the formin uh, diaphanol. So first of all, what is um, palmitolation? So palmitolation is a post-translational modification of proteins where a cysteine in the protein gets modified with a palmitate. And uh, this re is reversible. So you have the PETs, the palmitoyl acyltransferases, which put the palmitate on the cysteine. And then you have the APTs, acyl uh, protein palmito no, uh, theoesterases, which then remove the, the palmitate again. And um, there, there are many studies already that, that have shown that sphingolipids interact with palmitoylated proteins. They change their localization, uh, their trafficking, their activity and stability. And interestingly, our collaborators from the Van der Hood, um, lab have shown already that the human anthrax toxin receptor is indeed palmitoylated. So they could also show that zebrafish um, anthrax toxin receptor is palmitoylated. And um, if one mutates uh, two of the three possible cysteines that do get uh, palmitolated, um, you actually interestingly get the same phenotype as with a sphingolipid knockdown. So I showed you before sphingolipid knockdown, the actin cap is okay, the anthrax toxin uh, receptor cap is okay, but then uh, while the recruitment of the diaphanous and the row A is okay, um, the, the mitotic spindle doesn't get aligned with the caps. And the exact same thing is happening also when you downregulate the palmitolation of the anthrax toxin receptor. So by, by mutating the cysteines, the actin cap is okay, the anthrax toxin receptor cap is okay, but then um, the spindle doesn't get pulled in and you get divisions which are not aligned with the two caps and therefore also not aligned with the embryonic axis. So indeed, um, sphingolipids um, are needed 
to permitulate the anthrax toxin receptor. So if you knock down SPT activity in, in cells, you see that the anthrax toxin receptor gets less permitulated. Here's a quantification. And um, this prohibits um, the activation of the formin diaphanous. So if we um, mutate the cysteines in the anthrax toxin receptor, uh, we don't get enough permutulation and we get random uh, cell divisions. But if we express a dom dominant active diaphanous, so uh, uh, a formin that is always active, we can restore the oriented cell divisions again. So uh, we get random cell divisions in the, in the palmitoylation deficient uh, mutant, but then we can rescue it by um, expressing activated diaphanous. So um, this leads us to, to our current working model, which is the wind 5 uh, signal uh, polarizes the cell row A through the activity of rho kinase and myosin forms this cortical actin cap. The anthrax toxin receptor is recruited there and then uh, it uh, activates diaphanous. If it's properly palmitolated, it activates diaphanous, which then brings in the, the mitotic spindle and um, aligns uh, the cell division with the embryonic axis. If um, the sphingolipids are low, what happens is that the anthrax toxin receptor is not properly palmitolated. Diaphanous uh, gets recruited, but it does not get activated, and therefore we don't get a spindle alignment and we get randomized uh, cell divisions. Okay, so um, this brings me to my acknowledgments. I would like to thank uh, the whole Ritzmann lab, the uh, Irinka. Um, and the Gonzalez lab that brought in the zebrafish expertise, um, the, Gis uh, the Van der Hoot lab at EPFL and Laurence that did most of the protein biochemistry. And then um, I didn't show the, the new software that uh, Marcus and Florian developed um, to visualize lipidomics changes. If you're interested, it's, it's in, the, in the paper. Um, but yeah, most of all, I would like to uh, thank somebody who is not even on the paper, and this is, is Howard, for all the years of mentorship um, that he has granted me. And uh, we, yes, uh, to, to give me the chance to work on this uh, independent project also. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, yeah, just um, as mentioned, I'm off now. I'm going to head the metabolomics facility at the SEM. In, in Vienna, and there they are mainly working on cancer, inflammation, immune disorders, rare diseases, personalized medicine. So I think there's also going to be quite a bit of interesting sphingolipid biology there. Um, and yes, thank you to all of you, and I'm looking forward to questions. <laughs>